good evening, everyone, and welcome to Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy's Ambassador John Price and Marcia Price World Affairs Lecture Series. My name is Emma Russell. I'm the Events and Outreach Director at UCCD. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's lecture, Pursuing Sustainable and Inclusive Peace in Afghanistan. Tonight, we have a lot of new faces, so I would love to begin by explaining a little bit about UCCD. For 50 years, we have hosted a range of international exchange programs through the US Department of State, welcoming over 10,000 global leaders from over more than 200 countries to Utah. And over the past 50 years, those global leaders have participated in more than 300,000 meetings, school tours, volunteer activities, and cultural activities that each give a unique Utah experience to those visitors. We have also hosted more than 100 lectures through the Ambassador John Price and Marcia Price World Affairs Lecture Series, such as the one you're joining today. These shape public discourse by bringing leading global voices to Utah. Before we welcome Scott Warden, I have a few announcements and housekeeping items. This is a completely sold out event, so please help us by following these Zoom guidelines. We have chosen to host this lecture in a meeting style rather than a webinar to create a sense of community so that we can see you and you can see us. You're invited to keep your video cameras on However, please know that we will be recording this lecture. We also ask that everyone remains muted throughout the lecture to prevent any background noise. Lastly, we encourage everyone to use the chat feature throughout the conversation to ask questions or add comments. I will also be attaching any relevant links or additional information in the chat as well. After Scott's lecture, we will conduct a question and answer session. All questions must be submitted in the chat box. Ahmed, our facilitator, will then ask the questions on your behalf during the question and answer period. Although in-person events continue to be suspended, UCCD is committed to providing the same high quality programming and events virtually. I would love to invite you all to join us for our new community podcast, Fireside Chats. This podcast series is inspired by the evening radio addresses given by US Frank President Franklin D. Roosevelt, where he would quell rumors and explain his policies. These chats are short conversations with Utah citizen diplomats who are reformulating the American worldview from one of despair to one of a hope during multiple crises. These conversations are discussion-based to allow participants to engage directly with the speaker. Our next chat is this Thursday with special guest Nathaniel Coleman. He is a professional climber and a member of the USA Olympic climbing team. Nathaniel is one of four members on the team who will be representing the USA during Climbing Olympics debut as a sport in Tokyo. His episode is entitled Climbing and Caring for Wild Spaces. He will discuss his connection to areas around the world, such as Spain and South Africa, as well as those close to home in Little Cottonwood Canyon, Utah. We still have a few spots available, so in just a moment, I'll be linking um, the reservations for that in the chat box. All right, so with COVID restrictions, many of you have been probably working all day virtually or attending virtual school all day. So we are just so genuinely thankful that you guys are choosing to be with us again right now in your evening. Um, I know that you've probably fought through a lot of Zoom fatigue to, to sit here with us today. So as a thank you to our participants, UCCD is beginning a new engagement activity. At the end of the question and answer session, a Zoom quiz will pop up on everyone's screen. This quiz will be questions based completely on Scott's lecture from the moment he begins speaking until the end of the question and answers. I'm keeping a running tally of all the participants scores and at the end of fall we will have a prize for the winner. I already have noticed that there's a lot of participants in the audience tonight who are actually tied for first, second and third place. So definitely keep competing. You also receive bonus points for attending more than one lecture. So sign up for future events. It's pretty easy to catch up into first place. Again, that quiz will happen at the end of the question and answer period. So stick around in order to compete. Now I will pass it over to our executive director, Felicia Maxfield Barrett. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Felicia. I'm the executive director of UCCD, and I'm just scrolling through, taking a look at all the names and the faces. And I have to say that it's so incredibly good to see you all. It's been such a long time. So absolutely thrilled that you're able to join us tonight, uh, for tonight's lecture. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Ambassador John Price and Marcia Price for their commitment to diplomacy through the World Affair Lecture Series. Salt Lake City Mayor and Aaron Mendenhall and the Arts, Culture, and Events Fund that supports this series. 
Westminster College and President Dobkin for their continual support and their partnership. World Affair Councils of America for the incredible support that they provide to networks like us around America. And to you, the residents of Salt Lake County for your continued support of the All Arts, Culture and Recreation Grant through, um, let me back up, for the continued support of Arts, Culture and Recreation through Salt Lake City County Zoo Arts and Parks or the ZAP, ZAP program in which our lecture series is a recipient. Um, now tonight, I'm really excited to introduce our facilitator. Many of you know him as our International Exchange Program Director, Ahmed Zia Afzali. Um, for, for those of you who might not know, he's from Afghanistan, so who better to facilitate this conversation than him? So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to him. Um, and thank you, Ahmed, for volunteering tonight. Thank you, Felicia. Again, uh, my name is Ahmed Afzali, and I am honored to introduce uh, our speaker uh, for tonight's lecture, um, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, Mr. Scott Warden. Scott is the director of Afghanistan and Central Asia program at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, he comes into this role with an extensive background in reconstruction development, democracy, and governance uh, policy, among others, as well as extensive regional expertise on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, before joining a USIP, or um, United States Insti Institute of Peace, he was the director of the Lessons Learned program at the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction and served as acting director of policy as well as a senior policy advisor for the Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs at the United States Agency for International Development or USAID. And at the latter position, he was responsible for advising senior officials on strategies for sustainable development in Afghanistan and Pakistan. During his time at USIP, Scott directed rule of law development programs for the USIP and served as uh, a United Nations appointed uh, electoral complaints commissioner for 2009 uh, Afghanistan elections, as well as advising the UN on elections in 2005 to 2006. Scott has a decade of extensive um, experience working on Afghanistan issues and working in the field. Originally from Boston, Scott earned his bachelor's degree from uh, Colgate University and uh, JD from Harvard Law School. Um, Scott, thank you very much for all you have done for my home country. Uh, I'm honored to be here tonight and I know uh, all these uh, efforts and programs that you have been involved. I uh, was in Afghanistan and I have experienced and I have uh, uh, been in, in one way or another involved and I was a university student at that time. And uh, I'm grateful for all the efforts you have done and I know how important those uh, efforts and those involvements by the US and international community was. Um, and I was also honored to be uh, one of the trainees for US, USIP trainings in, in Kabul in 2008, which was fantastic and amazing. With that, I will pass the time to you and, uh, and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Ahmad, uh, also Felicia and Emma for organizing this and to the U Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy. Uh, but especially to all of you who have taken an interest, uh, I really appreciate your attention and time on this. Um, I, I want to, I guess I have about a half an hour, maybe I won't take it all because I'm certainly interested in, in hearing from you and taking questions and seeing what the audience is interested in. Uh, but I want to talk kind of in, in two halves, first about the past and then about the current and the future. Um, I, I do want to give a little bit of context for um, how, what the situation is in Afghanistan, how did it get that way? Because I think that's really essential to understanding where to go from here. 
And what are US interests in Afghanistan? Uh, and how can they be satisfied through the, the current engagement and the peace process that has just begun? Um, I have a few slides uh, that um, I'll show up just to put up just as illustrations, um, but uh, I really want to make this as conversational as possible. Um, let me say a few words just about US Institute of Peace, where I work now. Um, this is a, a somewhat unique institution within Washington. We were created by an act of Congress in 1984, and we are a bipartisan institution. We're run by a bipartisan board. We only receive US government funding, uh, but we're independent of the executive branch. We're independent of the embassy and countries where we work. Uh, we have a field presence as well as, so we have elements of a think tank, a research institute in Washington, but we also have uh, an office in Kabul. Uh, there are offices in other conflict zones around the world. And what we try to do is bring best practices and comparative knowledge about peace building, conflict resolution uh, to specific hotspots where the U.S. has a national security or a foreign policy interest. But we also work with uh, local organizations in the countries that are affected. So we work with the Afghan government and Afghan government ministries, but we also uh, do a lot of work with Afghan citizen organizations and nonprofits, uh, as well as universities. We have an extensive university peace and conflict resolution uh, training program. So we try to understand the conflict from multiple dimensions, an international one and as well as a local one, and then bring that to bear on uh, recommendations about how to uh, prevent, mitigate, or resolve violent conflict. So uh, let me also mention that our connections with Utah, USIP, while we're based in Washington, does have connections with Utah. Um, and in the past, uh, a couple of my colleagues, I think, have spoken uh, to this group uh, about different areas of conflict resolution. Um, and we have provided grants to institutions like the Utah State University and the Salt Lake City Public Library. Uh, so it's great with that introduction to, to meet all of you. Let me start with uh, a little bit about what the conflict is fundamentally about. Uh, the short version is, I would say there are, there are three key things. It's about terrorism or counterterrorism from the United States perspective. It's about promoting regional stability because Afghanistan is surrounded. Uh, there's a map, uh, maybe you can see, but it's, it's, it's in a difficult neighborhood, I would say. So neighboring Iran, three of the former Soviet Central Asian republics, a brief border with China, and then mostly with Pakistan. Um, so th that's a volatile region for terrorism purposes, but also uh, conflicts amongst those countries and with Pakistan, uh, with India, just um, one state away from Afghanistan. So regional stability is key. And fundamentally, there needs to be a stable balance of power within Afghanistan uh, so that there are not continuing threats. So let me just go through each of those a little bit in more detail. Uh, number one concern for the US, as I mentioned, is, is terrorism. So the 9-11 attacks, of course, occurred from Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda still has a small presence in Afghanistan, uh, even though bin Laden is dead. Uh, Al-Qaeda has integrated networks with family and tribal groups in a lot of the border areas with Pakistan. So it remains not as great a threat, but a continuing threat. And then, of course, more recently, we have ISIS, uh, Islamic State, coming from Syria and Iraq and establishing uh, what you call outposts in, in Afghanistan. Um, overall, the US military has identified up to 20 different acronymized named terrorist groups, many, most of them smaller and less potent than ISIS or Al Qaeda. Um, but it is a serious concern. There still are safe havens. And that's our US overriding interest in providing uh, stability to the country and why our troops are there. So the goal is to eliminate the threat to the US homeland and our close allies um, directly by controlling the safe havens. In terms of regional stability, I'll just touch on that. You know, it doesn't often come out as, as clearly in the, in the US debate, but there are a lot of interests, national security interests in the region. So, First of all, if Afghanistan is to collapse back into civil war, Taliban control, millions of refugees would go to neighboring countries, which themselves are poor and unstable, and that can have a domino effect for conflict or at least uh, you know, increasing instability in the region. Uh, more recently, of course, we had uh, refugee migration from Afghanistan just in the tens of thousands, mostly to Europe, 
uh, but that created a, a lot of problems as Europe closed their borders. Um, so, you know, continued conflict isn't just a terrorist threat, it also is a migration, uh, a destabilizing migration threat. Um, I mentioned Pakistan and India, those are arch rivals, they both have nuclear weapons, uh, Pakistan being the less stable of the two, I would say. Uh, but certainly, if there is civil war or greater instability in Afghanistan, it will threaten Pakistan. And Pakistan, that is even more fearful than it is now with nuclear weapons, is a scary prospect for uh, the US and the world. So, Pakistan's stability also matters. And finally, we have this global economic trends, uh, as, as we're seeing from COVID and the collapse of the global supply chain. Um, you know, war and poverty in that region does affect uh, trade and economic conditions in the United States. So there is a, a I'd say, certainly a, a secondary interest to the counterterrorism issues, but there is certainly an economic interest in keeping uh, that area of the world prosperous uh, rather than needing more assistance, more humanitarian aid. So that's kind of from the U.S. perspective. Of course, from the Afghan perspective, this is a 40-year struggle for political control of the country. Uh, didn't, this, this war didn't start in 2001 when the U.S. invaded uh, or in 96 when the Taliban took over Kabul. Um, but really, we can trace this back about 40 plus years to uh, the late 1970s when there was a communist coup that overthrew the, overthrew the constitutional monarchy. We then had this you know, succession of conflicts. And so, uh, you know, very briefly, we had uh, the communist takeover, the Soviets then followed that up with moving troops into Afghanistan in 1979. Of course, this is the height of the Cold War. So the US supported uh, several Mujahideen factions to resist the Soviets. That was ultimately successful. The Soviets withdrew in 1989. Um, it's important to note for the current situation uh, and US assistance to Afghanistan that the communist government that was supported by the Soviet Union didn't fall immediately when the troops left. Rather, it fell after the Soviet Union collapsed and economic assistance, particularly economic assistance to the uh, Afghan military. When that went away, that's when the Mujahideen were able to finally take over. Um, then we have an era of civil war where the Mujahideen factions fought each other for control. The Taliban really emerged as a, as a counterpoint to the fierce fighting that was going on even after the Soviets left and the, and the communist government was overthrown. So initially they were welcomed as uh, providing peace and security uh, or at least stability. Um, but of course their reactionary rule was unwelcomed by the majority of Afghans. Then another resistance began. And so that brings us to 2001 when uh, the Taliban were about to take over the country. And interestingly, uh, Al-Qaeda and bin Laden, who was being sheltered in Afghanistan at the time, assassinated the leader of the resistance to the Taliban, Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, on September 10th. And then the 9-11 attacks, of course, for the next day. And so you can imagine that not anticipating the U.S. invasion, uh, the Al-Qaeda's goal was to help the Taliban finally take over the whole country and then have a nice position to uh, you know, commit further terrorist acts. So you know, the reason why I go through that history is to understand that this has been going on a long time. Uh, and the roots of the conflict are not just whatever objections the Taliban has to Western assistance, to US troops. Um, it's really a political fight and struggle that's been going on with different factions over now decades. Um, and some of the vectors of that conflict, I'll just, you know, give maybe too short a description of, but you, of course, have religious and ideological differences, and that gets, I think, the most attention. The Taliban are uh, a conservative, uh, extremely conservative, uh, you know, interpret have an extremely conservative interpretation of Islam, and Afghanistan traditionally is more progressive. Um, so there's a religious ideological element to this conflict, but it also is ethnic. There are four major ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Pashtuns are the most prominent. Pashtuns are largely where the Taliban draws their support from. But there's an ethnic balance of power that uh, has been a struggle over time. I would say as well, there is uh, an urban-rural divide that is increasingly sharp. So you probably have half the country that is uh, considered urban or 
urban and suburban now versus rural, and there are very different outlooks uh, and lifestyles and levels of education, levels of economic development, and that gap and those differences create tensions as well. So fundamentally, while I think this has been discussed most often in the U.S. as a, as a religious issue, as a terrorism issue, the roots of the conflict are political. Um, and it really, to resolve them, and you know, this is to foreshadow the current peace process, uh, the political balance of power between these different Afghan factions has to be uh, more adequately addressed. Um, let me see as well, going through the history. So, you know, why has it been so hard to resolve? Well, first of all, of course, when we're talking about ethnic, religious, ideological, um, you know, income, uh, disparity issues, those are not easy to resolve to begin with. Um, but I want to also, and I can't see the slides, I don't know if the pictures are going up, but I, I have a few um, illustrations uh, of the, the, some of the challenges that Afghanistan faces beyond what I've even described. Um, let me flip ahead to the photo, if you don't mind. Go a few slides further, and there's a photo, an aerial photo. Here you can see Afghanistan's difficult neighborhood. Right. So, so for those that uh, you know can see on the screen, there's there's two shots here, and I took both of these from from helicopter flights uh, going across Afghanistan, so somewhat low altitude. Um, on the left, what you see is the urban Afghanistan. So this is. Um, you know, basically squatter's huts with no facilities, no electricity, no uh, you know, uh, sewage system on the outskirts of Kabul, uh, just kind of creeping up the mountainside, uh, clearly unzoned. But this is an illustration of the pressures from conflict, from poverty, where people are being driven toward uh, the city centers and they're living in very difficult conditions there. Clearly a strain on resources. On your right, um, you know, to me, this just illustrates uh, the, the challenges of Afghanistan. Here you have. A, a, I like to say that a lot of the surface looks like a, a crumpled paper bag, you know, no trees, super dusty, very arid. And then that, those green streaks there are, you know, small river valleys where you can have irrigation. Um, but, you know, that makes up a small percentage of the, of the country. Most of it is, um, is unirrigated, unfarmable land. Um, so it's a super challenge for them just geographically, um, let alone the extra conflict dynamics that I mentioned. You go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, you know, this just, I'll just give you some snapshots here. Uh, so here's from 2017, it hasn't changed much. The Human Development Index, which rates, uh, looks at countries based on a whole variety of health, education, economic factors. Uh, the lighter shades mean lower down on <laughs> the development scale. And you can see that Afghanistan stands out in kind of the middle center of the map. Um, as clearly the least developed, and then Japan on the far right is the most developed. Uh, so you can see it lags behind all other countries in Asia, uh, with the exception of maybe Yemen down there in the corner. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then here's the here's the ranking. So it's 170 out of 189, and and you know uh, life expectancy is down at 64 years. Um, schooling has increased dramatically since the since the international intervention. Um, but you know, income per capita is, is extremely low uh, in the lowest tier of, of, uh, of economic development. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then you know, the toll of the conflict, we can represent this in any number of ways, but here we have uh, the, just the civilian casualties. So these are Afghan civilians that have been killed uh, in the conflict, I would say from both sides, because of course, unfortunately, there's collateral damage from uh, US and NATO airstrikes as well. But overwhelmingly, this is uh, from Taliban attacks. And uh, you can see 10,000 casualties a year for the last several years. The numbers for 2020, which are not depicted here, are even higher. It's been the most deadly year of conflict in Afghanistan uh, on this entire scale. Um, so the human costs um, are even the most serious. Um, so let me move to the next slide in terms of what the US's role has done. So, you know, the, the question I, the rhetorical question I'll try to answer is, can the US fix this? Um, you know, cer certainly after painting such a dire picture, there's a lot of discussion. Okay, can we, should we be doing so-called nation building? Uh, 
Um, what's the U.S. role? We can't fix all problems. Let's bring Afghanistan from being, you know, on the lowest of human development indices uh, to something that is more prosperous is a, is a multi-generational effort. Um, certainly, the U.S. investment has been incredibly high. I took this chart from Cigar, where I used to work with the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Uh, they monitor assistance programs from the U.S. government on behalf of Congress. Um, and so here you have the darker line is the direct military expenditures. So a total of $782 billion. Uh, and then the lighter line uh, down toward the bottom is civilian assistance. Um, interestingly, a lot of that is from the Department of Defense as well because they fund the Afghan uh, military training programs. But overall, what we call civilian assistance is 124 billion, so almost a trillion dollars. Um, you know, sure, surely in, with the benefit of hindsight, we could have gotten more for less. Um, but that's the, that's the cost. I guess the other interesting thing to note, though, is the trend line. You see the, the big hump in the middle is the surge that began in 2009 through 2011, uh, where we tried uh, a robust military presence, over 100,000 troops, as well as the highest aid levels that we've ever had in Afghanistan. It is tapering down. Um, and those numbers go even lower uh, if we had it for the next year. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so that was our economic assistance. And then this depicts our uh, actual arm, actual number of troops. And so these are different categories of troops. The, the dark line with the circles around it, um, kind of in the middle of the graph, are actual combat troops. And you'll notice it ends in FY17 because the US military stopped uh, telling Cigar exactly how many troops it had. But basically, it's been a flat line uh, continuing to the right. And then this year, uh, I'll talk about a little more in the peace process. We went from about 10,000, where that is, that, that line depicts 10,000. And then we're, we're down to about 5,000 now. So troops are coming down. Economic uh, assistance is coming down, but it's still fairly high level. Um, let me just talk a few more words about the US interest, and I'll close by discussing the current peace talks. Um, you know, as I said, it's, it's impossible to rebuild Afghanistan to a middle income level um, in, in even the 20 years that uh, we've been there. Um, but, you know, there is a reason, and this is an argument that I make, uh, obviously there can be different views on this. You know, even though our fundamental interest in Afghanistan is a security one and it's a counterterrorism one, we have to address certain state building issues, certain governance. As I said, the conflict is political. We have to address political underlying causes of the conflict in order to provide the security that we seek. Because it's a political conflict uh, and because it's proven to be impossible, even with huge military resources, lots of combat troops to actually defeat the Taliban. Um, you know, if we don't solve the basic uh, extreme fragility, both politically and economically in Afghanistan, the terror safe havens will continue. Um, and so I think there's no way, my argument is there's no way out of this conflict um, without addressing certain elements, fundamental elements of state building of stable governance, um, or else we're going to have to keep intervening militarily uh, every 10 or 20 years or so when a new bad attack happens. Um, so the building of the state is integral to the provision of security that we're seeking. Um, let me then go to negotiation. So the last picture up there, which doesn't need to stay up, but that was uh, just the opening of talks of Secretary Pompeo um, and, and special U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan peace talks, Zalmay Khalilzad, were at the opening, uh, the signing, that is, of the uh, U.S. agreement with the Taliban. So right now we have talks going on between the Afghan factions in Doha, Qatar. Um, this is a goal for the last 10 years that was very elusive. The Taliban refused while fighting was going on to talk to the Afghan government, which they seem, see as illegitimate, a Western puppet, a US puppet, et cetera. Um, the US had, long, had a longstanding policy of not talking to the Taliban without the Afghan government present. And so, there it stood and the fighting continued. This uh, current administration had a change in policy that produced a bit of a breakthrough. Um, so after appointing Ambassador Khalilzad, he 
broke with previous policy and negotiated directly with the Taliban on the removal of US troops. And they reached an agreement that has four main parts. So first, US troops agree, US agreed to a conditional withdrawal timeline of US combat troops such that all troops will be out by May of next year, May 2021. Uh, that is if the Taliban cut ties with terrorist groups, renounce Al Qaeda, and agree not to attack US forces. Um, so those are the basic elements of the deal. And then with that in place, the Taliban agreed to talk directly to the Afghan government, as well as other political representatives. And they agreed to discuss uh, violence reduction moving toward a permanent ceasefire. And so that provided the framework for the talks that just began. Now, I will say the, the US agreement was signed in February. Talks were supposed to begin among the Afghans 10 days later. And it didn't, took until September for that to occur because of delays over some prisoner releases that were also part of the deal. So it's taken a long time to get to this point. Meanwhile, US troops have started to draw down from about 15,000 then to 10, and now we're at about 5,000 or 4,500. Um, the talks, unfortunately, while they began, they haven't gone very far. Uh, the Afghan sides are still deadlocked on an agenda on rules of procedure. And there are major concerns that Afghans have about you know, whether the Taliban really are serious about talking or are they trying to run out the clock, get US troops out of the country so that they can then have greater military advantage and take over. Um, if I can just outline a few of the key issues that we're facing in talks and then I'll close and, and take questions. Uh, the most dominant question that Afghans are discussing is the, the fundamental structure of the government. So will it be a continued democratic republic, so-called Islamic Republic, which is in the current constitution, or will it be an emirate? So a theocratic uh, state that's run by religious elites that the Taliban, you know, if they had the power would select, which is how they ran the country from 96 to 2001. Um, Afghanistan, I mean, the gains that have been made are substantially in terms of individual rights and freedoms, uh, particularly women's rights. So women were treated atrociously by the Taliban, had no rights essentially. Um, now at least legally are granted equal rights, although it's a challenge to enforce them. Um, there's free media, there's Indian soap operas, uh, there's free commerce. I mean, all these things that were denied in the Taliban, nobody wants to go back to Taliban rule. And the Taliban consistently have about a 5% approval rating in national polls. So they're not popular, they're only strong because of their military uh, force and the government's weakness because it's quite divided and, and corrupt. Um, so anyway, you still have this conflict where most people prefer a democratic republic as, that, as poorly as that works versus a return to Taliban rule. So will the Taliban uh, have enough strength militarily or at the negotiating table to reimpose uh, a, a harsh religious regime or not. Um, you know, the other thing, as I said, this is a political dispute fundamentally, is how do you cut a new deal among the major ethnic and political factions to, you know, more equitably share power among these different groups? Right now, the Afghan government under the constitution is often described as winner take all. If you win the presidency, you can control appointments and patronage all the way down to the district level. Um, and a lot of the democratic institutions that are established in the constitution, including local elected bodies, either have never been um, elected or, or don't properly work. So there are significant inequality issues, even taking aside the Taliban's desire for power that have to be resolved. And I'm happy to answer more questions on that but I think there are formulas of power sharing that you can look to where you can divide the political pie, if you will, uh, in more even pieces. But everybody, the elites in particular who are represented at the talks, who are present at the talks, uh, you know, have a very zero sum, I don't wanna lose any of my power mentality. So you know, it's a real question as to whether you'll have productive negotiations going forward or not. The final thing I would just say again about the, the troop withdrawal, and I don't want to be political here, but you know, the main leverage that the US has to get the Taliban to adhere to the terrorism commitments it made in the agreement, as well as the leverage that it can lend support to what is our ally in the Afghan government, um, a westernized, uh, cooperative, 
uh, regime in the middle of a, a dangerous neighborhood next to Iran, et cetera. There's lots of reasons why we want to continue to support the Afghan government. The main leverage that we have in this whole negotiation is the presence of US combat troops. Um, and so, you know, as you look ahead, the question really is, what are the linkages between the number of troops, which are committed to go down to zero, at least by May? And of course, everybody's seen that uh, the president has made announcements of even faster withdrawals um, that the military is somewhat pushed back on. Um, but if the troops go down to zero without any concession to the negotiating table, it will fundamentally alter the dynamic at, uh, you know, at the peace talks and the Taliban would have a, a significantly greater advantage than they do now. So I will close there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Scott, for this amazing uh, presentation. It just took me back to Afghanistan as you were talking, and I was imagining uh, when Not I was sure there. Good or bad. <laughs> uh, it, it was fantastic. Great. Thank you. There are a lot of uh, good questions, but I just wanted to um, quickly ask uh, a question uh, that I wanted to ask, and then I will get to some of those questions that are, or hopefully all of them, if we have time. Um, so. I know you talked about the Mujahideen faction in the 90s, and then the civil war, and then finally after the 9-11, and then this uh, collapse of Taliban regime, the, at least this uh, democratic government to some extent uh, was formed, and all those Mujahideen factions, at least they agreed to be part of the same government, to share the power, and to to work together, how much they got along with each other uh, is a different conversation, but at least they became part of one uh, government for, for the better part of, uh, at least until now, uh, if, if it is, there is a government, a lot of them are still part of that government. But my question is, do you think it is worth the effort to negotiate with Taliban because I do remember I was in the elementary or middle school from the time they, they started in, the, uh, in, in Kandahar province in the southern part of Afghanistan. They never stopped their violence and atrocity, let alone talking about human rights, women's rights, or any, anything else. So do you think a negotiation to bring them and make them part of the uh, uh, sharing power, would, would, would they even fit? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and uh, you know, I hesitate to answer that when, when you have, you know, difficult personal experience with them. I, look, who knows? I don't know. Probably not. You know, I'm skeptical. But I would put it this way. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a general line of questioning, and, and I think yours fits into it, of when we're talking about negotiating with the Taliban, either the US negotiations or now Afghan negotiations, can we trust the Taliban? Uh, have they changed is, is often discussed. And I think the clear answer, and this is true of any negotiation, particularly a peace negotiation where you have been at war is no, do not trust the enemy. Assume that they are, you know, uh, I think they may, hopefully they've changed a little bit. I think they, from people that talk to the Taliban, which is not me directly, um, you know, they learned some lessons, maybe not the right ones from the 90s, but clearly their, their, uh, their approach then left them internationally isolated and then ultimately invaded. So um, I think there have been some changes, but fundamentally assume the worst or assume skepticism, take on skepticism. But it's really just about, it's about interests. And I mean, I'm a lawyer by training, so maybe I have the uh, some optimism in this regard, but you know, fundamentally, it's it's negotiating de a deal and a system that has checks and balances, but which the Taliban can buy into, so that their their negative ambitions are constrained. Um, I think the biggest source of strength that the Afghan republic, let's say, has uh, are its people, and, and I think it's an underutilized resource because even though Afghanistan is a democracy and people want it, it's a struggling democracy, and elections have always been fraud filled and controversial. But what I, as I said, the, the popular approval of the Taliban is extremely low. Nobody would vote for the Taliban, you know, for dog catcher. Well, that's a bad pun. But nobody would vote for the Taliban for 
for even minor positions if they were not coerced to do so. Um, so, you know, looking ahead, it's easier said than done, but I think that, you know, there is a good chance to absorb the Taliban, to oppose them once you get to a ceasefire. So if you can cut a political framework deal that gives a little bit, and it's not my position to say what should be given up, um, but it makes a compromise at the elite level, uh, and then violence reduces, a lot of the fighters will realize, as they did during brief ceasefires that occurred in the past two years, that all of the negative propaganda the Taliban commanders give to their fighters who are out in the, you know, in the mountains uh, is not true. You know, uh, there's not immorality running crazy in the streets of capitals. Uh, and when, when Taliban see that, they kind of wonder what they've been fighting for. So there is a process where you cut a political deal, you get peace, then you get the Afghan public, which has changed in the last 20 years uh, remarkably progressively, uh, to try to be the counterweight to what the Taliban might prefer um, as far as a conservative rule. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we have a lot of good questions in the chat box. Um, I'm gonna start with that uh, order that I, uh, that I received and hopefully we can get to as many of them as possible. The first question is, uh, how can we uh, prioritize the Afghan people and their human rights over uh, quote unquote, America first ideology and troop withdrawal? What needs to happen in US foreign policy for this to happen? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think part of the answer I was, I was just discussing uh, in terms of the, the asset that there is in the Afghan people. Um, and so, you know, I think from a U.S. perspective, obviously U.S. and, and, and our Western allies who have uh, together given particularly civilian assistance in massive levels, have uh, funded education, training, um, have helped to enforce as well as with the U.N., uh, human rights and, and civil rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. We've, we've, I think, done a lot that's good for creating the civil space for civil society and human rights activists to, uh, to operate. So we shouldn't stop that, number one. Um, but number two, I think it's really about prioritizing democracy, a democratic system, a republic system, as a needed end state for a political solution in Afghanistan. Um, and that has been kind of mutely, it, it, very quietly stated, I would say, uh, as far as the conditions go in the current peace talks. And I think there's an opportunity to, now the peace talks has begun, to be a bit, a bit more robust, a bit more clear that uh, a system that well, I say democratic, there are lots of different forms of democracy and you can change the electoral laws and so forth. But a system that fundamentally um, relies on the will of the people and equal rights of, to vote of men and women um, is going to be the best way to empower and enable uh, civil rights, human rights in the country. So I think that it is legitimate to advocate for, prefer, put pressure on a peace process that does not go toward an emirate. And if you can do that, uh, I think a lot of other uh, good things will follow. Thank you. Uh, uh, next question, uh, has the COVID-19 pandemic escalated, influenced the conflict or impacted the increased count of civilian deaths uh, this year? Yeah, great question. You know, for the COVID situation in Afghanistan is a bit of a mystery. Um, it should be one of the most vulnerable countries in the world because it has, you know, we talk about uh, underlying health conditions being a risk factor for COVID and they are abundant in Afghanistan. Um, you had a huge outbreak in Iran. That was one of the first countries badly hit. And there's essentially a porous border between Iran and Afghanistan. A lot of migrant laborers came back from Iran. You'd think it would be one of the worst affected. Um, it does not seem, apart from a spike about two, two and a half months ago, um, it does not seem like there has been the explosion of cases in Afghanistan that there has been uh, in a lot of more developed countries. Now, part of the problem, you know, why is that? Is that true? Um, health 
records <laughs> are terrible in Afghanistan. There's very few hospitals that would be overrun. You know, you wouldn't know. Um, and certainly, um, you know, deaths did increase in a, in a period of brief period of time. But Kabul is reopened. The country is reopened. Our office, we're kind of the last to reopen because we're, we're understandably cautious about our our staff and kind of uh, follow the the guidance. Um, but they don't seem to have been too badly affected. And I mean, the final thing I will say, which is a, which is a sad commentary, you know, there are also such, there's such higher mortality in Afghanistan to begin with from civilian casualties, which I showed from underlying, you know, non COVID health that, um, you know, relatively um, they're dealing with a lot and COVID is just one of many problems. Um, but so far, anyway, the, the COVID, COVID has not, uh, affected as badly as a lot of other countries. Thank you, Scott. I am going to add also that exactly same information that I have. So I have my whole family in Afghanistan. So I am the only one came in here and I was super worried and nervous about them. Few months ago, when I was talking to them back home, they were worried. There were lots of uh, um, concern about COVID, but in the past at least two or three months, weekly I talk to my family, I ask them how is the COVID situation, they say, we're good, uh, things are not too bad, and I even ask them, have you been in the hospital, how is the situation of hospitals, especially in rural parts of the country, and where my family is from a rural part of the country, and they say, the hospital situation is similar to pre-COVID almost. I'm like, if the hospital situation is like that, then I feel good a little bit. But if you're telling me, oh, there is no COVID, but then the hospital is full of patients, then I would feel worried. So yeah, that, uh, that's the uh, message I get from my family too. Thank you. Um, uh, second, next question. Given your experience with uh, USAID and SIG uh, AR, and how looking at Afghanistan from the vintage of the peace process directly, do you see any uh, form of US economic or development assistance that would have a direct impact on the success or uh, forwarding of the potential peace agreements? If so, where do you believe the focus should be? That's a great question. I, I mean, first I would just go back to the, the, the point that it's, it's kind of political and diplomatic leverage and US troops that I think have the biggest impact on the course of the peace talks. Um, and so that has to be a, a foundational part of a strategy to get to a successful conclusion. Um, but, you know, as far as the economic assistance goes, I think the most important message is that we cannot uh, lower assistance, drop assistance levels just when the troops go, and we can't walk away and assume that the job is done when it, whenever a peace deal is signed. Uh, and I made the point about the Soviet withdrawal uh, to, to underscore that, which is, you know, the absence of troops is going to be a challenge for the Afghan government, but the an absence of money to implement the peace agreement um, will almost surely cause it to collapse. Now, I think that the opportunities in the context of a peace agreement change and increase as to where money will be spent and how, and how efficient, how much benefit we can get out of it. Um, so certainly, uh, large areas of the country have been cut off from basic development assistance, whether that's health or schools or, uh, or other uh, for basic infrastructure. So I think in some ways there's a need to at least shift money, if not spend more money on developing those areas. So there's not inequality after the peace deal that causes political grievances that, that make it collapse. Um, so focusing on areas that are now free of fighting uh, would be one priority. And I think also, you know, Conditional economic assistance has not worked very well in Afghanistan. Every year we try to tie our aid to reduce corruption and it doesn't work. Um, there are some lessons learned, but it, it's not like you can just 
say we'll withhold money uh, unless you follow our policy priorities. Um, having said that, I think that larger incentives for, let's say, developing areas that implement the peace process better or giving conditional aid that say, if you actually hold, let's, let's say part of the reintegration plan is local elections uh, that include the Taliban. Those areas that have it successfully can get uh, greater assistance. I think there are ways that you can use economic assistance as leverage uh, to implement the peace deal. Uh, and then the third thing I would say, which is not really economic assistance, but it has to do with supporting the peace process overall, is that there has to be international monitoring and probably international dispute resolution for the terms of the deal. And that applies at the high political level, but fundamentally the conflict in Afghanistan is played out on, on local terms uh, with local rivalries exacerbating it. So there needs to be an investment into uh, monitoring mechanisms so that these uh, local deals can be enforced and people uh, get jobs, um, you know, see some benefit when they stop fighting or else they'll be tempted to go back to war. Thank you. Uh, another question from your personal experience, what are the attitudes and feelings of Afghan citizens towards US military presence? Uh, how does that compare with uh, the leadership in the Afghan government? Yeah, great question. Well, I, and I should ask Ahmad to, <laughs> to answer that as well. You know, my personal experience, which is, from, which is in cities in Afghanistan, mostly in Kabul, but on some provincial capitals, is that you know, Afghans, any Afghans that I meet uh, are overwhelmingly grateful for US forces, US assistance, uh, you know, international, more broadly international uh, engagement and so forth. Uh, now that's a selected sample. If I went to a rural area that had been you know, victim of fighting for both sides that it had bombardments, you know, even if they're going after Taliban, there's a lot of damage caused by US uh, and NATO airstrikes and so forth. You know, you'll get a very different attitude, understandably. But I think that from surveys as well as personal experience, um, you know, most Afghans, they really want a connection to the outside world. Uh, that's their neighbors, but it's the West as well. And so uh, it's one, uh, it is an attitude of gratitude that that you most often hear. Afghan government, look, you know, they are fundamental allies. They, uh, for political reasons, and it, we'll say negative things about our assistance, but I mean, it is crystal clear uh, to any Afghan leader that US support, European support and beyond that is, you know, existential for them. It, they, they cannot, uh, you know, maintain the, the government or their probably their personal positions uh, without a strong alliance with the US and the West. And so the rhetoric may get hostile uh, at times, um, but fundamentally that relationship is quite sound. 100% agreed, Scott. And, uh, and I'm gonna also add that Scott mentioned that there are four main ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And if you want to specifically know how uh, each ethnic group feels towards the US military and US uh, uh, involvement in Afghanistan, you will probably find each ethnic group would have uh, a different view, not a not hundred percent, but a high percentage of people would probably have a different view in the southern and eastern part of Afghanistan rather than what you hear in the central or northern part of Afghanistan. Uh, and the next question, what role does a trust play from the viewpoint of Afghan citizens? Uh, if I could, I'd ask for a clarification, you know, trust for, toward us or toward each other. Um, but uh, I mean, I'll try to, I'll try to interpret the question. Um, you know, one of the biggest threats, I would say, I, I think I addressed the, the, the relationship with the West. Certainly there is, there are concerns in the current peace process, most expressed by the Afghan government, but also civil society leaders that, um, you know, they fear the U.S. is going to abandon them, uh, let them down. And the U.S. is, a, you know, representing the larger European and NATO allies as well. Um, so, you know, I think that 
that there is a question of there's there's a loss of trust uh, that uh, the U.S. will be uh, in Afghanistan to stay forever. That said, I think you know the messaging has been uh, quite clear over several administrations now that the goal of the United States and Western allies is to continue to support Afghanistan, but not at the levels um, that are required during an ongoing war. And so I think this is there's a difficult uh, you know what weaning process uh, from such high levels of aid to something that is more self-sustaining. Um, if the question is about trust among Afghans, I think that's uh, unfortunately extremely low uh, in general, uh, but, but now in particular, because over the last five years, I would say, you know, as the Taliban have gained military strength, which relates to the US and others withdrawing militarily or drawing down, um, ethnic tensions have been higher uh, than at any point, at least in the last 20 years, uh, since 2001. Uh, political distrust among, let's say, Ashraf Ghani and, and Abdullah Abdullah, who have uh, battled each other in the elections over the last two uh, election cycles, um, you know, that's, uh, that's quite, that trust is quite low. And obviously, there's no trust between the Taliban and the, and the Afghan people. So I think one of the biggest hurdles, if this is where the question was going, for the peace process is the trust deficit among the Afghans. We've kind of pushed them into a room and said, okay, talk together. Yes, it needs to be an Afghan solution at the end, but I think without more guidance and probably more active mediation by uh, international actors, and I would say a neutral party, not the US, um, then this trust deficit is gonna really delay talks if not prevent an agreement. So we are kind of run and not kind of actually, we are running out of time, but on the other hand, there are so many questions that uh, I'm receiving in the chat box. Uh, Emma, would it be okay if I ask one more question before I pass to you? Yes, that'd be perfect. Sounds good. Um, is there is still any lasting effect of the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, or has that government and population forgotten about that era? Um, that's a good question. You know, <laughs> there's probably there's probably a little bit of nostalgia amongst older generations that are around for that because the Soviet era, from my understanding, uh, you know, in Kabul was quite peaceful. Uh, and in city, in a lot of urban areas, it was developed and, and women's rights were promoted relative to the past uh, by the, the communist regime. So, uh, you know, as people contemplate a more, uh, you know, dire fate if the Taliban were to come back in, in significant form, um, you know, some some might have positive uh, views toward that. But fundamentally, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've just been scanning the chats. Uh, you know, somebody pointed out that there's been a couple of generations. You know, Afghanistan is a young country. There's a high birth rate. I mean, I don't know what the number is, but very few people, the, the majority of people were not alive during that time. Um, and so I think it's really, we've now had 20 years of the U.S., NATO-led intervention, and that's kind of set the tone and the expectations. And I think the Soviet era doesn't have much of a legacy right now. Um, yeah, so I'll end there. I'm, I'm sorry I can't get to the other good questions. I've just been kind of reading this. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll be happy to <laughs> answer questions if, if anybody wants to forward them to me uh, through the organizers. I can yeah, answer. I can absolutely. I'll take any questions that were unanswered and I'll email them to Scott and I'll directly forward any answers on to those um, participants. So for sure. Thank you so much for your willingness to do that. So yes, I just want you. to thank everyone so much for joining this evening. I am about to launch the poll that is based completely on the conversation that you just heard from Scott. So answer this as I will be doing my closing remarks. All right, so you should all see it. So just thank you so much, Scott, for joining us this evening. Um, it was an incredible lecture. I've been seeing so much on the news about this and it was really helpful to hear it from your perspective and gain insight on what these peace talks really look like. Um, so I really enjoyed this lecture. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for joining us as our facilitator. And of course, Ambassador John Price and Marcia Price for providing the continued support to have this lecture series. Thank you to all the participants who took time for their Tuesdays. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed this lecture as well and that you learned something. Tomorrow, all of you will receive an email that includes both a survey on your experience as well as a link to the recording of this lecture.
we would greatly appreciate it if you completed the survey so that we can make improvements in the future. This lecture is officially over. Thank you all. I will keep the meeting live so that those of you who are filling out the poll can continue to do so, so that you'll compete for the prize. Um, but thank you to everyone and thank you so much, Scott. Thank you very much for hosting me. And, of course. Uh, happy to talk to you.